Hi, and welcome to this webinar. Now, this is a really important topic that we're going to be talking about today. And I'm presenting my thesis research from my honours degree, which was really the springboard for my PhD research. So I'm going to share my screen and um, let's get started. So the really important thing um, that we need to establish is, are we using the right form of folate? Now, we traditionally expect that um, people will use folic acid because that's what's always been used. Um, and as you know, just because it's what's always been used doesn't mean that's what we necessarily should use going forward. So I conducted this. So to start, my name's Carolyn Ladowski. I'm a researcher. I'm a naturopath. I'm currently doing my PhD at the University of Technology in Sydney. And the topic of that PhD, I'm doing a randomized clinical trial, actually testing folic acid versus methylfolate in women who have had recurrent miscarriage to see if we get a better result. And this came about because of this research that I'm about to present to you today. Now, um, I did this research through Endeavour College of Natural Health. It's not yet published, um, but we are presenting it to um, journals now to see if we can get it published. Now, the, the reason that this is so important, and you all know that infertility is a major issue. There's 70 million couples being affected worldwide. That is not a small number. And we've got to be able to question what we're doing and say, hey, is everything that we're doing actually everything that we should be doing? And we know that genetics to some degree is a factor in infertility. One of these, the, the genes being studied the most is the MTHFR gene. Now, MTHFR just is a long, a short, shortened version of what it means, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. And essentially what it is, it's the gene that makes the enzyme that makes your active folate. And without active folate, you can't methylate your DNA and therefore the quality of your DNA and your partner's DNA is not going to be good enough quality for you to have a successful pregnancy. Now, research is, you know, there's some research that says categorically MTHFR matters and there's other research that says, well, we don't actually know if it matters. But part of the reason is the studies are not all testing the same thing. So some of the studies allowed people to smoke. Some of the studies allowed people to be vegan or vegetarian during the study, which is going to affect the uptake of folate. So we're not really testing everything on the same the same way which is what we should be doing so my question in this research is are practitioners varying the dose and form of folate they're prescribing to infertility patients with mthfr polymorphisms and you may think oh well that doesn't that doesn't affect me because mthfr polymorphisms are rare and a polymorphism is really something that is different from the norm that actually affects the way that that enzyme um, runs. And so you'd be surprised to note that up to 65% of people may have a mutation or a polymorphism in MTHFR, which affects folate. And our hypothesis was that those people that were aware of MTHFR in their fertility patients, they actually did change the folate they used. So if we just recap, a polymorphism is uh, one or two or more variants of a particular DNA sequence. And so we, if in the case of MTHFR, it means that we've got an amino acid change. So for example, if this is a sequence of DNA, you can see here that it may be substituted and the A could be substituted for a G or it could be substituted for a T. So that's essentially what we're talking about is something has been swapped in the DNA sequence that we expect to see. Now, in the case of MTHFR, that means 
there's a down regulation in the enzyme and it just doesn't work as well. Now let's recap on the forms of folic acid because I think many people just don't understand that there are different forms of folate. So folic acid is man-made and it's supplemental, right? So what that means is it doesn't exist naturally in your body. The only way you can get folic acid is if you ingest it, either in a supplement or in um, food fortified with folic acid. Now, because it's not a natural form of folate, it has to go through a particular enzyme called DHFR to actually work. Now, in my experience with my um, infertility patients, many of you do actually have DHFR mutations along with MTHFR, which means if that's the case, that folate, folic acid you're taking is actually not going to help the quality of your DNA at all because you can't use it. And that's a problem. And the research also says the higher the folic acid, the more likely that DHFR enzyme is to be inhibited. So if you're taking food, if you're eating food with folic acid in it, which in the US and here in Australia and Canada, by law, all your bread products, your flour-based products have to be fortified with folic acid. And when they first started fortification, it was only a little bit. You know, you're only meant to be getting a little bit. But now we're getting a lot, and that is potentially a problem. Now, there's folinic acid. Now, it is a metabolically active form, but you've still got to use that MTHFR enzyme to convert it to your biologically active form, methylfolate. And then there's methylfolate, which is your biologically active form. It goes on to make SAMI, regulates your DNA expression and gene expression. And that's what gives you your good quality DNA. So we generally just look at two MTHFR polymorphisms when we're testing, because that's where the majority of the research currently lies. And the two forms we check are the C. 677T and the A1298C. Now, essentially, if you are homozygous, it means you've got two copies that are downregulated and you got them from mum and dad. If you're heterozygous or say CT or AC, you, do, you got one copy from either mum or dad because you remember your mum and dad both had two copies of these genes, and they randomly gave you one. You don't know which one gave you what, they, but they randomly gave it to you. So you can, you can end up with two copies that are downregulated, you can end up with one copy, or you can end up with none. And we call that the wild type when there's none. But if you're homozygous for the C, whoops, if you're homozygous for the C677T, you can actually see it's a 60 to 70% downregulation in your ability to make methylfolate. That's huge. One copy, it's 30 to 40%. And if you have the A1298C, two copies is 50%. And if you have one of each, it's about 40 to 50%. So we're not talking about insignificant amounts here. A 60 to 70% down regulation in your biologically active folate that methylates your DNA that then ensures the quality of your DNA so you don't miscarry, in my book, that's considerable. So what we want to be able to do is we ask this question. Do practitioners who test for MTHFR genetic polymorphisms in infertility patients use different forms and dosages of dietary and supplemental folate? And so to get a little bit of a background, I did what's called a literature review, which is a systematic process that you go through and it takes months and months and months to look at all the literature that exists on MTHFR polymorphisms and see whether 
there was enough research to show that this would actually affect people, particularly those going through assisted reproductive technologies. And we found that there was a link between MTHFR and infertility in those going through IVF and assisted reproductive technologies. And the people don't you know, really think about this, but there's a phenomenal amount of studies that show that if men have MTHFR, they have reduced sperm count, reduced quality of sperm, and reduced fertility. So we've got this whole premise of we just check women. But if you are not checking your partner and yourself for MTHFR polymorphisms, you're, you're not doing your due diligence. Because if your partner has MTHFR and his folate is low and you don't, then you can still miscarry. Oh, my God, that's huge, right? So to review the research, we also looked at women and it showed that they have reduced oocytes or eggs, reduced quality of those eggs, reduced folliculogenesis, susceptibility to recurrent miscarriage and raised AMH levels. So not only is it affecting men and sperm quality and sperm count and perhaps making you more susceptible to miscarriage, but it's also affecting your egg quality and your DNA. And so, as I said, these studies don't categorically say, yes, this is definitively a problem because there's too many confounding factors. Some, some, most studies don't take folic acid out of the picture in the, in the diet. That's major. Most studies don't look at the diet that the people were eating at the time. And as I said, vegans and vegetarians are going to be hugely susceptible. And a lot of these studies come out of India where we have a huge proponent of vegans and vegetarians because of their religion but they're not getting enough B12. And if they don't get enough B12, they can't use their folate. So we, we found, firstly, studies show a link with MTHFR and infertility. They showed that it is a link to sperm count and sperm quality, that there's a link with female fertility. And we also found that there's really not enough research on the different forms of folate and infertility. And we also found that really there's not a lot of information on dosage. There's a little bit, but not enough. And so we assume that 400 micrograms, which is the recommendation, recommendation by the governing, governing bodies, is enough for people with MTHFR. But it may not be. So this is what this particular case study series was looking at. So we, our aims were to really see what the pregnancy outcomes were in patients accessing fertility treatments who had MTHFR genetic polymorphisms. We wanted to look and see which form of MTHFR polymorphism they had. And we also wanted to document the different dosages and forms of supplementary and dietary folate that they gave to these patients. So we, we took Australian practitioners who work in the field of infertility um, and we asked them to submit information on their infertility patients. And we were hoping to get a minimum of five cases and we were including women 20 to 49 years of age who had been diagnosed with infertility and had MTHFR polymorphisms. So here are our results. So we had 12 patient cases were submitted by six practitioners and we looked at what MTHFR polymorphism did they have, what advice did they give their patients about folic acid, what folate supplementation did they give, what dose did they give and what was the pregnancy outcome. So here's our cases. We had one woman who was 26 to 30 years of age, had had five miscarriages and one failed IVF. 
we had five women in 31 to 35 years of age, and you can see they had all had um, a previous miscarriage and one had had um, an IVF and one had had a trisomy um, miscarriage. We had three in the 36 to 40 years of age. Again, all had had previous miscarriages. One um, had endometriosis. We had two 41 to 45 years of age. And I'm, I'm really, um, as I progress through my research and see you know, the results like this, that I think less and less we have an age issue. I am not at all worried about patients that I see over 40, because as you can see, we do get success with 40 year olds. So we had two 41 to 45, one woman had had no pregnancies ever. Um, she did have endometriosis and the other one had had five failed IVF and two failed miscarriage and two miscarriages. And then we had one lady over 46 years of age. She would never had a pregnancy, but she'd had 10 failed IVF, 10. Wouldn't you think after two, someone would go, oh, okay, there's something wrong here. Maybe we need to do things differently. That would have cost her over $120,000 to have them fail. So every single case had MTH5 polymorphisms. One was homozygous for the C677T. Five were heterozygous, which means they had one copy. And in the A1298C, two were heterozygous. And compound heterozygous, where they have one of each, there were four in that category. And that's what it looks like. So you can see that um, this was the C6, the orange is the C677T, um, which was the largest group. And then the yellow is the... Um, the yellow is the compound heterozygous, so we had four of those. All right, so form of folate. So when these patients came to the practitioner, half of them were taking folate and two were taking what we call the standard high-dose folic acid of 500 micrograms or more. Now, this is tends to be the response from IVF specialists, when they see MTHFR polymorphisms, the standard protocol is to give these women 5,000 micrograms of folic acid. Now, remember we said in the beginning that folic acid is not used as, as well, um, and the higher the dose, the bigger the problem. So that's potentially a problem. The Every single practitioner removed folic acid in the supplements that they were giving their patients, every 100%. And 75% of them said, not only do I want you to avoid it in supplements, but I want you to avoid it in food. And all of the patients were given methylfolate over everything else. So... Here is, um, these are our 12 women. And you can see here, um, these are the polymorphisms that they have. And this is what they were told in terms of folic acid. Avoid it, be mindful of it, um, don't take it at all, etc. Now, when we look at um, the dose, as I said, everyone was given methylfolate. But guess what the mean maximum dose was given to every patient? So the mean means the average, the middle of the mark, right? So they were given 2,325 micrograms per day of methyl folate, not folinic, not folic acid, methyl folate. Now, that's a lot more than you are probably taking. Now, for Linux, five patients were given a combination of methyl and for Linux. And if you've got it, I mean, that might be okay for those of you that don't have MTHFR polymorphisms, but 
In my experience, I believe you're better off having 100% methylfolate if you have MTHFR genes. And three patients presented with failed IVF, two are on high-dose folic acid, 5,000 micrograms at the initial appointment. Now, these two that were on the high dose actually successfully did fall pregnant with IVF. So here's the dose, which might surprise you. So everybody was given really good doses. Um, and you can see that there are a couple, probably the A1298C heterozygous doesn't bother us as much. But certainly this C677T that actually fell pregnant in the time frame, but she miscarried twice. But you can see how much lower she is in folate than the other women. Because look at this, C677 heterozygous, she was on 3,500. This one was on 3,800. This one on 1,600, 2,500. Oh, I keep clicking and going back. Um, so she was on a low dose. And we have to ask the question, which unfortunately we don't know the answer to, but if she was taking closer to 2,000 micrograms, would she perhaps not have miscarried? We don't know the answer to that. But if you look at all the others, you might think that there's a possibility. Now, the pregnancy outcomes were quite mind-blowing in that, remember, all 12 were diagnosed by a fertility specialist, except one who was diagnosed by a general practitioner or an MD, um, with infertility. We had 11 pregnancies and 10 live births. 10 of these women successfully fell pregnant when we changed the dose and the form of folate. Like seriously? And this is why, unfortunately, not many people take note of case studies because in a research field, they're probably at the bottom of the list in terms of people saying, well, that's good quality substantive research that I can take notice of. So this is why I'm doing my PhD because the top of the line is a double-blinded placebo-controlled um, research um, control study. So this is what we're trying to do is get the evidence so people stand up and listen. Now here's, so this is the exciting page. One, this woman fell pregnant successfully and had a child. She had had one miscarriage and three failed IVF. The second lady had five previous miscarriages, successfully fell pregnant, successfully had a baby. Same with this lady, two miscarriages, three failed IUI, successfully fell pregnant, successfully had a baby. Look at this lady, two miscarriages, five failed IVF, a previous pregnancy um, and live birth through ICSI, but she actually then went on to have a baby. This woman, two miscarriages, one trisomy, successfully had a baby. Three miscarriages, one previous live birth, successfully had a baby. Now, this is the lady who had had two miscarriages. In this study period, she fell pregnant twice, but miscarried twice. And we suppose, we don't know, but we might hypothesize that she just wasn't taking enough folate. And this was the only lady we really didn't have any success with. Um, so she had never had a pregnancy. She'd had four failed IVF. But in this particular study, we didn't have the resources nor the time to look at the partners. And this is the instance where I would look at the partner and say, I'm not assuming that it's you. I'm going to assume at this point because you've had so much treatment that it's possibly the quality of the sperm and that your partner is um, perhaps got the low folate. But unfortunately, we didn't know the answer to that. And look at here, our lady who had had 10 failed IVF, 
who was on the high dose folic acid, guess what? She fell pregnant and had a baby, which is really exciting. And so you see the success in this. It is massive. And this is why I had to continue. 83% of these women had miscarriage history. And interestingly, we had a 91.7% success rate. 91.7. Who can say that? And interestingly, the pregnancies actually happened quite quickly. So you can see appointment two, appointment four, appointment two, 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 right? So, you know, it's working fairly quickly. I like to say you should have a minimum of four months on your um, methylfolate-based um, prenatal because you really want 120 days to get that folate right. And for men, they need 90 days, which is that length of the sperm. There's no point in using your all the old cells that have no folate. So 120 days. So what I like to say is take your methylfolate, but do not fall pregnant for 120 days. Now, I know that many of you who have been waiting years and years and years and years and years, you think, oh, my God, I can't wait anymore. But please, I implore you, you have to wait that 120 days. Set your diary and just, and then once 120 days up, as long as your partner is doing it as well, as long as your partner is doing it as well, then 120 days you go for it. But I'd like to think that you have a better success rate like these women. And this is the summary. So you can see the level of folate, what the outcome was, um, and all but one woman did not fall pregnant during the study period. But 10 women went on to have a live birth. It's, it's pretty phenomenal when you look at that. And I can't wait to get our trial started. And so this is what I was saying before about folate. You see folic acid has to go through this DHFR twice to become tetrahydrofolate, whereas food folate and methylfolate don't. Methylfolate comes in right here. And this is where you need it, right down the bottom. Folinic is also out here. You still have to convert it through MTHFR. So I think it's really important to remember the, about your forms of folate. And so here's the discussion points as a result of this research. The findings suggest that practitioners are actually telling their patients to avoid folic acid in the diet. Leafy green forms, as I said, better, better metabolize, cross the, 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 the gut lumen way, way better. And there is concern in the research that some women are getting too high a dose of folate. Now, we call that unmetabolized folic acid. It's not being used. It's unmetabolized. Now, we don't know 100% the significance of it, but it is suggested in some of the research that it acts as a folate antagonist, which means it's actually inhibiting your good folate. That's a bit scary. We need to know if that's true. We need research. And I know that we, you know, there's this whole dichotomy of why we're we waiting for the research. We shouldn't wait for the research. We should work on what we know. All you fertility patients, infertility patients, need to do what these women did. Don't wait for the research. But what the medical profession and the, the IVF specialists, they will wait for the research before they make a move because we live in such a litigious world. And until they get research to categorically say this is a problem, um, they're not going to swap. But that's my mission in life, to make sure that we get the evidence so they do swap, so that we don't have the amount of women um, miscarrying 
and having stillbirths and having problems like we do. And folic acid, you know, there's research to show that methylfolate gets folate levels up way quicker than folic acid. It's also the main form of folate in the cord blood that crosses to the baby. You know, maybe that's why um, we see these methylfolate babies actually doing a lot better in their developmental process. And they believe that this methylfolate through pregnancy actually affects the baby's health for life. And we also know that methylfolate gets the red cell folate up quicker and it bypasses MTHFR polymorphisms. So you're actually jumping over the problem, which is really significant. And the dose is the interesting thing because the research says that 800 micrograms um, will jump over the mutation. But in my experience, Somewhere between two and 5,000 micrograms is where I go with these women with MTHFR polymorphisms. Having said that, if you don't have an MTHFR polymorphism, I still would be using methylfolate and I still would be using around about 1,500 to 2,000, probably closer to 1,500 micrograms if I didn't have an MTHFR polymorphism. And so the... Definitely when it comes to, um, you can see, every single one of these women had an MTHFR polymorphism, every single one. So if you don't know, you've got to know, and that is super important. Now, obviously, this is a really small sample size, and we didn't have a comparison group. But, and because it's a case study, we can't say that this then means that everybody in the community, from a research perspective, we can't say, okay, well, this is what everybody in the community needs to do. We need the study that I'm about to do to do that. However, case studies are always a good starting point because it, it helps us isolate things that perhaps we need to do in the future. So this is why this is actually quite, um, quite a good study. So I think there's a few things to come out of this, at which I think was really exciting, was the, the fertility outcome. And, and in my mind, the amount of research that I've done after the, over the last 12 years, I don't think there's any basis on which to not use methylfolate. We know it increases folate levels. There's enough um, clinical trials with um, infertility patients. Uh, you know, you saw these, these women, none of them had neural tube defects. And in fact, there are studies in the pipeline now to, to look at uh, methylfolate and um, how it impacts neural tube defects or not. But one would suppose that because it's increasing folate better, it's increasing it faster, then it's got to be a, a superior form when it comes to neural tube defects because the jury isn't, you know, out necessarily. All right. So as I said, we can't, we can't use this and extrapolate it um, into the wider community. But although it's, you know, the lowest form of evidence from a research perspective, it actually gives us a really good observation as to what is happening. Okay, so we know infertility is growing, um, a growing concern. I really think that we need to make sure that we are doing this properly. Um, if you, I think one of the, the most important things is I would like to say to you, if you are interested um, in more information, jump into our fertility site, which is MTH, mthfrfertility.com. And there's so much information. There's more videos on the topic. Um, just jump in, have a look, make sure that you're looking at our resource centres. We've got 10-day free courses 
genetic testing, all those things that you may need. And if you do have more questions for me, um, then please just email um, info at mthfrsupport.com.au. All right. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Bye for now.